Biotechnology seems to be leading a sudden new biological revolution. It has brought us to the brink of a world of engineered products that are based in the natural world rather than on chemical and industrial processes. Biotechnology has been described as genus phased. It implies that there are two sides. On one, techniques allow DNA to be manipulated to move genes from one organism to another. On the other hand, it involves relatively new techniques, whose consequences are sometimes untested and should be met with caution. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Hon again. Now, welcome to the biotechnology series. In this series, I will introduce some of the most impactful and relevant biotechnology concepts and topics that have made a profound impact on our lives. Topics in the biotechnology series include historical review of biotechnology and genetic engineering, traditional methods of DNA manipulation in biotechnology, PCR and RT-PCR technologies, antibody usage in diagnostic and biosensing, antibody drug conjugates, CRISPR technology, RNA technology, and ligand evolution. Many of these topics have also received Nobel Prizes. Now here are the learning objectives of this lecture. First one is to create a clone of self that can study, take tests, and go to work while you stay home. Don't we all want that? Just kidding. Now we will discuss historical and current definitions of biotechnology and genetic engineering, highlight significant events in the evolution of biotechnology, outline the steps in DNA cutting splicing in order to construct recombinant DNA, define the functions of endonucleases, ligases, and vectors, and discuss how the selection of successfully transfectured or transformed cells is accomplished. So when did the term of biotechnology came about? Now, the term biotechnology was coined in 1917 by an Hungarian engineer, Karl Erke. Now, at that time, the term meant all the lines of work by which products are produced from raw materials with the aid of living organisms. So at the time, it was used to just to describe large-scale production of pigs using sugar beets as a food. Now, that is not very much of biotechnology we have in mind, but at the time, the scientists envisioned a biochemical age similar to the Stone Age and Iron Age. Well, anyway, biotechnology is not new, and man has been manipulating living organisms to solve problems and impact the way of life for millennia. Biotechnology can most easily be defined as any biotechnology that relies on living organisms or biological systems. And by this definition, human beings have been using biotechnology for thousands of years to produce food products, textiles, and other necessary items. Some of the items that you are probably familiar with include leavened or yeast rising bread, yogurt, cheese, wine, beer, and vinegar. Now, all of these products are produced with the help of cultured microorganisms, and some examples of these products are listed here and illustrated in the picture. Now, however, the term biotechnology has become to mean the use of genetic engineering and associated techniques in a variety of applications from medicine to agriculture. Now let's look at some of the major events in the evolution of biotechnology. The root of modern biotechnology can be traced to the work of Louis Pasteur, Robert Cook, and Gregor Mendel approximately 100 years ago. Now Pasteur and Cook laid the groundwork for the current science of microbiology, while Gregor Mendel described the laws of genetic inheritance. 
many scientists contributed to the advancement of these fields, ultimately leading to the discovery of DNA as the genetic material and the subsequent determination of the structure of DNA in the early 1950s by James Watson and Francis Craig. That with the discovery of the structure of DNA, the direct manipulation of genetic traits become a possibility. In the early 1970s, several laboratories at various universities, including the University of California at San Francisco, Stanford University, Harvard University, developed techniques for inserting foreign genes into bacteria. And with these development, the stage was set for the revolution in biotechnology. But technology at the beginning of the 20th century began to bring industry and agriculture together. During World War I, fermentation processes were developed that produced acetone from starch and paint sovereigns for the rapidly growing automobile industry. Work in the 1930s was geared toward using surplus agricultural products to supply industry instead of imports of uh, petrochemicals. The advent of World War II brought the manufacture of penicillin. The biotechnical focus moved to pharmaceuticals. Francis Craig and James Watson, who with the work of Rosalind Franklin, discovered the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953, and for this discovery were awarded the 1962 Nobel Prize Award along with another scientist. Their work became the basis for the Human Genome Project. Watson went on to head the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, raising major funds for basic science research, and Dr. Watson was noted for the administrative success and named uh, to the head of the Human Genome Project. Francis Crick and George Gamow also explained the central dogma of molecular biology, which DNA makes RNA through transcription and RNA makes protein through the process of translation. In 1966, it was determined that a DNA sequence of three nucleotide bases determines each of the 20 amino acids that make up a protein after that DNA code is transcribed into the messenger RNA code. Now in the messenger RNA code, each amino acid is designated by a triplet of nucleotides called codon. In 1973, Cohen and Boyer produced first recombinant DNA organism that is start the beginning of genetic engineering. Now, the two scientists removed a plasmid, a small rings of DNA located in a cell cytoplasm, not the nucleus, from a cell. Then they used restriction enzymes to cut the DNA at precise locations and then recombined the DNA strands in a special configuration that they desired. Now finally, Cohen and Boyer inserted that spliced DNA into E. coli bacteria cells, which reproduced the altered DNA. Now with the altered DNA, the bacteria cells could be made to produce specific proteins. Today's biotechnology corporations implement recombinant DNA technology to get bacteria to add as a biological manufacturers of proteins valuable in science, medicine, and agriculture. Now, everything changes with the development of recombinant DNA technology. It has enabled new organisms for productions of non-native molecules and proteins. For example, Jen and Ted was the first to employ recombinant DNA technology into E. coli to produce human insulin in 1978. Before the availability of recombinant human insulin, type 1 diabetes and also some type 2 diabetes patients who relied on insulin have to take insulin from cows and pigs. These were effective treatment, however, because the animal insulin was not identical to the human material, and physicians became increasingly concerned with the effect of its long-term use. And furthermore, by the mid-1970s, there was considerable 
concern about the long-term supply of insulin from animal sources as the population of diabetic patients continue to grow. Now, insulin therefore become an ideal target for a small group of biochemists and molecular biologists seeking to apply the new techniques of genetic engineering to human diseases. Now, this technique relied on the fact that insulin was a protein. And like all proteins, it consists of a chain of building blocks called amino acids. The order of amino acids in a protein is not random, but rather it's unique to the insulin. Now, when the sequence of amino acid is known, the corresponding sequence of DNA can be isolated, or in this particular case, it was chemically synthesized and introduced into a bacteria cells with the help of a small circular plasmid DNA to make the human protein. Now, the approach that Boyer and his colleagues took in synthesizing a gene was unheard of at that time. This approach is now more common. However, other methods of directly or indirectly isolating the actual human DNA are more routinely used. As developed by Boyer's company, uh, Genentech recombinant human insulin became biotechnology's first product in October 1982. The Cold War years uh, were dominated by work with microorganisms in preparation for biological warfare as well as antibiotics and fermentation processes. In 1981, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that living organisms or living things could be patterned. For example, an engineered microbe designed to eat oil can be patterned. But prior to this, living organisms were considered natural and could not be patterned. Now, this gave rise to ethical or perhaps even civil rights issues if higher plants and animals could be patterned. And very soon, uh, foreign genes were transferred in plants, and by 1985, genetic engineered plants could be patterned, and the first living mammal was patterned in 1988. Now, prior to the advancement of recombinant DNA methods, scientists were limited to the techniques of their time, uh, such as cross-pollination, selective breeding, pesticide herbicides to improve crop yields and resistance to diseases. But today, biotechnology has its root in chemistry, physics, and biology, and the explosion of the techniques have resulted in three major branches of genetic engineering, um, diagnostic techniques, and as well as cells and tissue techniques. Now, however, the public tends to react more negatively to genetically engineered agricultural products as opposed to common medicines such as recombinant insulin. The next big leap in biotechnology was the introduction of Dolly in 1997. Now, Dolly the sheep was the first mammal to have been successfully cloned from an adult somatic cell. Now, she was cloned at the Roslyn Institute in Scotland and lived there until her death when she was six years old. The cloning technique was made famous by her birth is somatic cell nuclear transfer, in which a cell is placed in a denucleated ovum and two cells fuse and then develop into an embryo. Now, when Dolly was cloned in 1996 from a cell taken from a six-year-old sheep, she became the center of much controversial that still exists today. The process or the technique of cloning Dolly the sheep was not that complicated actually. And here is a simplified graph to illustrate the process. Now first we need to have two sheep. The white faced sheep is the sheep that is donating the somatic cell. And we also have a black faced sheep that is donating an ovum. Now the egg cell from the black faced sheep was then are denucleated, okay, and then placed next to the donor cell. And about one to eight hours after the removal of the egg cell, an electrical pulse was used to fuse the two cells together and at the same time activate the development of an 
embryo. Now, this technique sort of mimicking the activation provided by sperm. However, that is not completely correct because only a few electrically activated cells survived long enough to produce an embryo. Now, after that, the embryo is transplanted to a different、uh, foster mother sheep and carry that embryo and developed in the womb, and、uh, Dolly was born. Now, however, later in 1999, research was published in the journal Nature, suggesting that Dolly may have been susceptible to premature aging due to shortened telomere in her cells. Now, it was speculated that these were passed on from her donor sibling, who was six years old when the genetic material was taken from her. So that Dolly may have been genetically six years old at birth. Now this is because a telomere length is reduced after each cell division, which requires DNA replication before mitosis occur. And the polymerase part of the replication machinery cannot reach the end of the chromosome being replicated and.、Uh, Clips a little off of the telomere at the end、uh, every time it replicates, so、uh, that may be lead to the premature aging and premature death of Dolly. Today, the practical use of recombinant DNA technology is mainly in the agricultural, protein industry, environmental, and biotechnology and biomedical. Now, the main purposes were to increase production speed, yield, and disease resistance, and to manufacture a large amount of important or therapeutic proteins rapidly and at a low cost. Now, however, there are huge social impacts associated with genetic engineering. The first one being is a safety concern about the release and uncontrolled replications of genetically engineered microbes into the environment, because some of them may be harmful to other organisms or the environment. Now, so to reduce that potential risk. A lot of the time, these microbes are engineered with some metabolic defects that can only be overcome or enabled by giving a growth factor. And these growth factor are usually not naturally occurring in their environment. So by doing this, we can control their growth even if it is accidentally released. Another huge consideration is about ethical considerations. These DNA manipulation techniques and other newer techniques that we will talk about in the later half of this series do have the great potential for harm and causing, you know, harm to people. And one of the biggest concern is potentially genetic engineering human. Okay. What is the ethical,、uh, the, you know, the standard behind that? When what we should not do that. At the same time, how do we prevent it from happening? Now, also,、uh, you know, there is a great concern about genetic privacy.、Uh, is that going to used against us? Right. So all of these are huge ethical concerns that we need to be aware of. Now, all in all, in combination, the modern days of molecular biotechnology is a combination of different fields. It requires knowledges from molecular biology, microbiology, biochemistry, immunology, genetics, chemical engineering, and cell biology to all put into one melting pot. And the output of biotechnology is to potentially enhance crop yield. Disease resistant, producing new drugs, vaccines, and applied in diagnostic, and as well as, you know, in enhancing our livestock. We've spent some time looking at the history, and I've eluded the term recombinant DNA technology. So now let's look at recombinant DNA technology, the first form of genetic engineering, and what are the methods and techniques that are involved in this field of research. So, by definition, genetic engineering is the deliberate modification of an organism's genetic information by directly changing its genome, and most commonly known to be done by a technique 
called recombinant DNA technology. Now, this basic technology is to move the gene of interest from one genome or from one organism to another organism or another genome utilizing in vitro recombinant of DNA molecules. Now, these changes can also be introduced to alter the final product, meaning alter the organism or potentially the phenotype, the expressions, and the proteins that they can produce. The general technique of recombinant DNA technologies are not that complicated and are routinely due in many molecular biology labs that are in many university research labs these days and as well as in my lab as well. Now, it involved having a piece of DNA from donor organisms being extracted and isolated and the gene of interest is being cut out with restriction endonucleases enzymes to isolate that piece of gene. Now that piece of gene is then ligated or stitched okay, into a cloning factor and that you know, stitched new cloning factor plasmid is then transferred into a uh, organism usually is through bacteria, okay, it's called transfection, and when that piece is transferred to a eukaryotic cell, it's called transformation. Now, this is done. This is genetic cloning, actually. Now, usually these whole cells do not uptake the constructs are being eliminated by some selection protocols using antibiotic resistance and reported genes. And we'll look at each of those individual steps in a little bit greater details. So here is the beginning of cloning a gene into bacteria cell. Now first we have a cloning vector, usually it's a plasmid DNA, and then we have a piece of foreign DNA that is being, you know, treated with restriction endonucleases. Now that does two things. At first it also cut the piece of gene of interest and also cut open the cloning vector. Now after it's mixed together in a you know, in a small uh, tube, a small test tube, uh, and different enzymes called ligase is going to put in to the mix and then perform ligation. Basically, it stitched the DNA back together, forming a recombinant DNA plasmid. Then the third step is to transfer that recombinant DNA plasmid into a bacteria cell. Now, notice that the plasmid DNA is separate from the bacterial genomic DNA as illustrated in this figure. The cutting of DNA is done by a special enzyme called restriction endonucleases. Now these endonucleases, the name tells you it does some cutting of nuclear acid within the strand versus some other enzymes called exonucleases where it cuts at the end cap there. Now here we are looking at an example of a restriction enzyme called echo R1. Now this enzyme can recognize a specific pattern of base pairs such as this illustrated here, the GAATTC. And once it recognizes there, it's going to cut, and in this case, in between the G and A. Now after this cutting or the cleavage, it leaves a overhang or a sticky end, which will easily match with the sticky end of another DNA segment that has been cut with the same enzyme. And this way it can, you know, form an a aligned uh, position that can be ligated or stitched back with ligases. After the DNA is treated with restriction endonucleases, it produces several pieces of DNA with different lengths or sizes. Now, some are bigger or longer and some are smaller or shorter. One way to quickly identify and separate the DNA fragment based on size is through a method called algorose gel electrophoresis. Agrose gel is like a molecular scythe, which the negatively charged DNA moves through the gel toward the positive electrode. 
and the smallest size DNA fragments move more quickly and migrate furthest down the gel, while larger DNA fragments move more slowly and run higher. The bands that containing the DNA fragments can be excised from the gel and purified for downstream applications. The top two photos are examples of gel chambers and the technique of loading the DNA samples into the agarose gel for gel electrophoresis. The bottom left gel picture looks exactly like the gel I ran in my lab. The blue and yellow lines are dyes that tell the user where the lightest or the smallest DNA fragments are approximately at so that they don't run off the gel. The bottom right image represents a gel containing DNA fragments that are bound to fluorescent dyes and are imaged under UV light and captured with a filtered camera. So those lines are indicators of a DNA fragment. After the DNA fragments and DNA plasmid are properly prepared, the next step in recombinant DNA technology is to insert or transfer the plasmid DNA into a cell. Whether it is a bacteria or eukaryotic cells, the process is similar but with different terminology. Transformation refers to putting the recombinant DNA into a bacteria cell and transfection refers to putting the foreign DNA into a eukaryotic cell. Generally, it takes less effort to transform bacteria cells than mammalian eukaryotic cells. The MyLab routinely performs transformation in competent E. coli cells with a simple heat shock technique. Another way to insert foreign DNA is through electroporation. Cells are suspended in DNA solution in a cuvette between two electrodes. Then a high voltage electric field pulse is applied. Some DNA may successfully migrate through the high voltage electric field induced openings in cells and yield successful transformation or transfection. However, the transformation and transfection process are not guaranteed to be successful. So we need ways to tell if the plasmid DNA is indeed being inserted into the cell. This can be done with the selection of genes that are on the plasmid vectors. Now, commercially available plasmid almost always contain resistant genes for a specific antibody. My lab routinely use a plasmid that contains an ampicillin resistant gene. Only the cell's colonies that successfully take up and express the plasmid vector will survive if the cell media is treated with that same antibiotic. Those that did not uptake the plasmid would not survive on the selective cell media. Another checking method is through a reporter gene. The most commonly used reporter gene system is called the LAG-Z gene. My lab also uses that. Now, similar to the antibiotic resistant gene, the LAG-Z gene is built in on the commercial plasmid vector. Now, those that successfully uptake the plasmid with an intact LAG-Z gene will produce an enzyme called beta-galactosidase that can hydrolyze lactose. In the lab, a substance called X-gel can also be hydrolyzed by the beta-galactosidase and produce an insoluble blue product. These cell colonies will appear as blue, meaning they have a plasmid and their LAG-Z gene is functioning. Now remember, the plasmid supposedly contain the gene of interest from another organism, but sometimes the ligation process failed to introduce or incorporate that piece of new gene. So even though the transformed cell may have the plasmid, the plasmid would not produce the protein of interest in this case. And by having the LAG-Z gene embedded in the restriction site, 
successful ligation of the new piece of gene of interest will disrupt the legacy gene. And when this happens, the cell's colonies will still survive on the selective media, but they would not produce beta galactosidase, and therefore they cannot generate blue pigment when treated with a substance XGAL. So they would appear white. This is a way to verify successful ligation of the donor gene sequence into the plasmid. After successful verification of the target gene and plasmid insertion, you now have successfully employed recombinant DNA technology to create a cell line that can produce the protein of interest. In my lab, I have a special E. coli cell line that can produce tag DNA polymerase in large quantities. This way, I don't have to purchase DNA polymerase from vendors for my polymerase chain reaction or PCL, which I routinely do in my lab. I have saved tens of thousands of dollars in these years because of wisely using recombinant DNA technology. Now, since I just mentioned PCR, we will talk about the most buzzing molecular biology technique that now almost all of us have heard of since 2020. So stay tuned, and I will see you next time for a lecture on PCR and RT-PCR. Take care.